Hey guys, Johnny Quirk back here once again, here to support your entrepreneurial journey. Okay, cool. So today on the show, we've actually got Monica from the Spice Club and Shick Shack. So uh, Monica, great to have you here. Hi, so good yeah, to be here. Yeah, I'm delighted you could me. join us today. Now, okay, so um, just obviously for uh, your reference, everybody, viewers and listeners out there, um, Monica is from the Spice Club and Shick Shack. She's going to tell us a little bit more about that. But she does incredible Indian food. And I have eaten just before recording this because if I couldn't, I wouldn't have been able to make it through the entire show. Um, I have been to some of Monica's uh, events. They are really amazing. Um, you know, food photography is incredible. So like I said, I'm fully loaded here, full of food. And hopefully I'm not going to have to dip off in the middle of this, obviously, for some food myself. So uh, Monica, great to have you here. So um, in your own words, please, could you describe your business and uh, obviously which what each of the businesses does? Yeah, sure. So if I start with the Spice Club first, which is my original yeah. baby, um, the Spice Club is a pop up restaurant and an Indian cookery school. So um, a pop up restaurant is it started off from my mom and dad's home kitchen. And um, that's uh, where I started doing my secret pop up dining events. Um, and so it started off in my home kitchen and the idea was to run these monthly dining events where people would come and enjoy proper home style Indian food in my own yeah. home. Um, and I still run those events um, a few times a year. And the second part of the Spice Club is the Indian Cookery School. And so I have a cookery school in Manchester and also Birmingham. And through those schools, I teach people how to master regional Indian cookery. Uh, when they come to my classes and uh, it's a whole lot of fun very tasty fun um, and I've very very uh, recently launched Shick Shack which is uh, a branch of the Spice Club and it's an online Indian cookery school so it's a membership uh, platform where members who join Shik Shik, they get the opportunity to um, have access to a master recipe library very detailed in depth uh, recipe videos that I've been working yeah, hard yeah. to record in my kitchen. Um, they also get access to monthly live cookery classes that I do over Facebook, as well as the online Shik Shak community where lots of Indian food lovers unite online to talk all things delicious Indian food. And also they get access to something called the WhatsApp curry clinic. Wow. I didn't so even know once about a week it. we all reunite and everyone <laughs> Yeah, so this is um, an exclusive part of the membership, which um, I thought would be really nice um, for anyone that has any questions when they do, you know, go to the, the the video library and they go into the kitchens and, you know, they might have a question. And sometimes it's, you get a little bit from asking a question on Facebook or sending me an email, but actually I think with Indian food, there's so many nuances yeah. and I wanted people to just be able to have a and have a chef on speed dial. So yeah, it's a whole lot of that. Don't we all? And I've got to say, like I said, I'm not going to keep on dropping personal references through this, but uh, you know, I lived out in India for six months <laughs> and I remember actually coming back to Manchester about 10, 11 years ago and having uh, Monica's food for the first time was like, this is food that genuinely takes you back to India. It actually tastes so authentic. It's very, very hard to get incredible Indian food here in the UK. Okay, there's some really good food around. But this was kind of really amazing and uh, I keep coming yeah. back to it, which is great. So delighted to hear. So uh, congratulations as well on Shik Shack. Uh, obviously, you're quite a recent launch for you as well. So I'm just interested to know. So um, I'm interested to know potentially what your business model is for obviously both businesses and like who are your customers as well? So um, with the, the, the supper club, the spice club and um, the supper club element and the Indian cookery school element. Um, interestingly, it's um, predominantly um, Caucasian yeah. customers and they range anywhere between 18 and 80. There, I cannot really fine tune <laughs> the age group. Um, I mean, I've had anywhere, especially in my cookery classes, I've had uh, about, I say 18, I've had my youngest student's been 11 um, and my eldest student's been 86. Um, and I remember that couple actually yeah. really well. There was a, an elderly couple came, the husband was 86, the wife was uh, maybe her early 80s and the husband was really into Indian yeah. food, loved it, was really passionate. 
and uh, he came, his wife, not so much. <laughs> and um, halfway through the cookery class, she just said, do you mind if I have a little sit down? And um, this was in a Manchester cookery class, which is based out of my mum's yeah. kitchen. And there's a little sofa there. So she had a little sit down. And then about half an hour later, all we hear is her snoring. <laughs> and she just fell asleep for the remainder of the time. So, you know, we cater to all ages. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's going to go <laughs> um, really up the yard and in, in terms of, like, the the care as well of being there. It's like, you know, you get everything. Exactly. It's proper Indian hospitality. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, we, we, we don't really have a, a target base. I think for us, it's if you enjoy Indian cookery and you either enjoy eating it or you would love to learn how to cook it, um, I mean, you know, that doesn't really um, hone into a small selection. That's a, a really big crowd. And so I've got a really diverse um, age group that come. Um, interestingly, in Birmingham, I'm seeing a slightly more diverse target group in terms of my customer base. I'm seeing a lot of young um, Asian uh, students yeah, come. Well, okay. So a lot of people, my generation, second born uh, Asian generation, and uh, they uh, love Indian food. They've grown up with it. They've probably moved yeah. house and, you know, they've moved out of their parents' place and they want to make the food that they grew up eating, but they don't know how to. So I'm seeing a big surge of young Asians, uh, uh, people coming to my Birmingham that's events. So that's been really interesting. Yeah, that's amazing. I guess they probably want to kind of yeah. like re-embrace uh, their roots or at least discover it for themselves as well. Yeah. Very cool. Exactly. Um, so that's been yeah. amazing. Yeah. And I think, you know, from, from people who know me, you know, like I've always had a fairly entrepreneurial and startup background. And one of the big things, which, you know, I remember writing numerous business plans, whether that was for myself or for people, it was like, you know, who's your target market? Who's kind of like that? But I love what you're just saying now is that it's fairly organic the way it's growing out. It's, you know, the, the people who want to find out about you, find out about you, however they do. You know, we'll talk about that a little bit later on. But you know, you're not just saying, right, we only cater to 20 to 35 year olds and they've got to be here and, and whatever. So I think sometimes it is quite good to let nature take its way, really. Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, th so interestingly, I'm the same. I've come from a really entrepreneurial background as well. Prior to starting the Spice Club and Shake Shack, I did different businesses in the world of fashion with my family. And I always had business plans for everything that yeah. I did up until I opened the Spice Club at Shik Shik. And these two businesses have been the most organic in the way that I've just thought I'd have a go. And I can't believe where they've led yeah. me. Um, yeah, I've just kind of let nature take its own. It's just been really I interesting. I think that's a good way. I think it's really, really strong. And I guess, you know, that kind of answers one of my questions because, you know, we've discussed this before, but you are from a strong entrepreneurial background. You know, was the, you know, I mean this in the nicest possible way, do you think there was any pressure to start your own business growing up or do you think it was just in the blood or you know you were encouraged from an early age you know I'm interested to know where that dynamic came where you just went do you know what I'm not going to take a nine to five you know behind a desk I'm going to go and do numerous things or whatever for myself where, where did that come from and, and how did you kind of like you know made it your own I think if I look back now um I think I would probably say uh, I was exposed to, you know, on, you know, my dad's business, my mum's business. I was constantly spending time in their yeah. workplace. You know, we'd my mum would pick me up from work, and we'd go back to her work before we'd go home. Or you know, if my dad was picking us up, you know, we'd go back to his uh, place of work until he finished, and then we'd go back, we'd go home. And so I think you know, it was always in our environment didn't really think about it and I don't I wouldn't say that we were pressured my brother and I at any point to go down a certain route my mum and dad have been f fairly open and supportive as to you know what we want to pursue in our career which I'm really grateful for um but there was an interesting time when my brother and I were at university we actually went to university at the same time went to the same university and this was abroad yep. and um we were in the States in Florida and um, we decided this was at the time where the exchange rate was really good between the US dollar and the Great British yep. Pound. I think it was two to one. So, you know, for us, everything was like 50% <laughs> off. It was fantastic. 
Um, and it was at the time where um, brands like, and I'm not sure if you're familiar with like Abercrombie and Fitch and Hollister yeah, yeah. and brands like that were really, really big. So um, my dad has always been um, in the fashion business. Yeah. That's his, his uh, sort of niche. Um, and so my brother and I, we've always been interested in fashion and also just retail. And we decided that this would be a really good time to um, start a business because yeah. we saw that if there was a demand for a product uh, in England yeah. uh, and we were getting it cheap in America, we would buy things like brands, like we'd go to Abercrombie and Fitch and Holston, buy, you know, a top for hundred pounds and then we, a hundred dollars and we'd sell it for hundred pounds yeah, yeah. on, on eBay. And we started this eBay business, which grew like crazy we ended up finishing our lectures at university and we'd go to the mall yeah, yeah. and it looked like these ridiculously rich children and we just have like a list of things that we'd sold on yeah, ebay yeah. and we hundreds of dollars on abercrombie and fitch and then just sell it in pounds and uh that's where that's the first business that my brother and i had we just thought oh this is this is, <laughs> this is, this is, this is this thing here and i think my dad always just taught us that you know just look for opportunities yeah. And I think that was in our blood more than anything else. And yeah, that kickstarted us going into business together. When we moved back to the UK, we started a fashion yeah. business together. But I think it has been in our blood in that we've always looked at our mum and dads and them being um, natural entrepreneurs and being opportunistic. Yeah, and I think that's something that we've always seen. And yeah, it's it's interesting to look back and think, you know, um where we start of course and i think you know i think what you just said there in terms of that early success you had with the ebay business it's kind of so strong because you know it kind of gets that fire in your belly then because you know you've got to work out a uh, you know, monetization strategy you know and, and a lot of businesses yeah. you know you know that that's nice because it felt, felt like it was fairly agile you know it was you had the platform already being ebay you could find a way there was obviously a strong margin and you could obviously you know do that yourselves really without having to have a team so i think that's kind of really strong but i think if you don't have that success early on you can you know potentially think all oh, right i'm just doing uh you know you're just learning through reading books or whatever this seems like practical startup advice which actually then are built uh, lets you build something on top of that as well yeah yeah absolutely i think and, and don't get me wrong i think um i think that sort of uh that fire in our belly as yeah. you said uh got us excited about business in general. Yeah. Um, and then we were, my brother and I have always been quite interested in, you know, um, reading about business and listening to different entrepreneurs. Back then, you know, podcasts weren't really a thing, yeah. but, you know, we would, you know, just sort of try and find resources about successful people or interviews with successful entrepreneurs. My dad was very much, a, very much an encourager of, you know, um, following successful people yeah. and and you know learning from what they've uh from the journey that they've gone yeah, through definitely. so yeah I, mean, I just thought i was really excited about business in general and now my brother's not in fashion and i'm not in fashion but we both have our own businesses in our own yeah, niches yeah. and it's just interesting you can always take those lessons with you no matter what business you end up starting yeah with. i agree monica i think that's really strong i think you know like there is so much you can learn i remember reading this uh, interview with brew dog the beer company early on and they went do you know how we've been successful and you know success is all you know relative you know this was probably seven or eight years ago they're much more successful now than what they were then but they were saying we would never take anything from a beer playbook about what anybody else in beer's done but we have borrowed, I guess you could say, or stolen ideas from other industries. And that's been a great yeah, thing. Yeah. So, you know, they've said, well, what worked in fashion, what worked in retail, what, you know, and could we replicate this into beer? Because if you're just doing what all of your competitors are doing, then, you know, you're not really doing anything that's fairly innovative, really. So borrow what you can. Yeah. So it sounds like almost you were like, almost like a, a pre Tim Ferriss in terms of like, or at least those kind of books, you know, like where, you know, like he writes about, you know, the, you know, on his podcast, he does kind of like top tips from successful people. And, you know, I've, I've got all of them. I can't get enough of them. And they're really useful. Even if I read it in bed for a couple of pages a night, it just gives you some insight. And you think, oh, I might just borrow that and see how I work. So uh, that's cool. And I guess, you know, you guys obviously you are in food now or you're definitely in food. And I'm just interested to know, like, obviously you've reached this point so i don't need to dig too much deeper in terms of like on that journey you know we'll talk about some kind of tips you've got in a few minutes but 
how would you kind of describe right now what you spend your days doing? You know, like, because, you know, we talked earlier about, you know, like this was off air, by the way, guys, what we were talking basically about, you know, being a solo entrepreneur and having to do everything yourself. But I'm just very, very interested in terms of like how you plan out your days, your weeks, your months, you know, are you setting yearly goals? I'm just very much interested about what your planning strategy is because I'm a big planner and I think it's very, very important that people get an idea about how they can manage their workload as being a solo entrepreneur. Yeah, that's been something that I found really difficult. <laughs> I think especially from almost being in a family business where, you know, you're part of this team to then just going to being a solo entrepreneur. That was, that's always been hard. And I think I found it harder more recently uh, with being at home a lot more uh, because of yeah. COVID. Uh, I've had to be a lot more organized. So um, I, I would say like right now, I'm not planning for more than three years from where I am right now. Yeah, three years I'm, is kind of solid. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> And um, I, I, in terms of my my daily, I, I use things like Asana and um, Todoist. Yeah. I make lots of lists. Yeah. Um, it's something that's come quite new to me. This is not something that I'm very good at. Um, planning as an entrepreneur, I mean, I think you always feel like, you know, if you're a good entrepreneur, you should be good yeah. at planning. I am actually not a very good planner. <laughs> and my other half, interestingly, is a very good planner. He's not an entrepreneur in the slightest. He's not, you know, he's actually a, a doctor. So his his way of thinking is not business minded at yeah, all. Quite linear, but he's one of, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I've actually learned a lot from him recently because he obviously, you know, has to yeah. plan. And so um, now I have um, task lists. I have short term, medium term, long term. Um, uh, lists um i have a daily list and i'm i'm very much about writing things yeah. down so as as fancy and as organized as my my online tools and softwares are i have to write down a list every single morning yeah. of what i'm going to do so i take it back to paper and pen there's, there's no shortcuts it's really about ticking things off for me so my mind works in that yeah. way that i have to really put things in front of me um I, I find planning uh it's probably one of the things that i find the most difficult to do um but with the most with the planning and the sort of um the launch of shik shik which has literally just gone yeah. live um had i not done those daily lists had i not um invested in those software tools mm. you know the making tools and those board making tools that allow me to integrate what i need to do yeah. when uh, i think I'd, I'd still be in prep mode I, There's no yeah chance. i mean it is i'm i'm a big list maker as well and again you know they're not always amazing because some things will get missed off your list one day but at least they kind of roll into the next day you know like there's i would probably always probably put 10 things on my list but then get around to maybe five or six and go oh right okay but yeah, you're right. If you don't, if you aren't making lists or even taking notes for inspiration while you're out and about, then who knows how many potential ideas are just kind of disappearing out of your head. You go, oh, that would be a great idea. Uh, I don't know how many envelopes are around here until I tidied my office the other day, had stuff written all over them. But, uh, you know, I do try and go through it once a week and go, rubbish, good idea, rubbish. Like, and then at least it will go into <laughs> calendar mode in GCAL or whatever uh, as well. Yeah. Exactly. You should see my notes up on my phone. Um, it's ridiculous. It's it's. If someone looked at it, they would just think this is just a load yeah. of babble. But in my head, you know, it's like what you say when you're going along. You pick things up. Yeah. And I have to put it on Google Notes, or I sometimes email myself, so then it comes at the top of my inbox when I go to sit down at my laptop. Yeah. Okay. That's probably yeah. Uh, yeah. You're right. Actually, I send a lot of emails to myself as well in terms of just doing that, and then you get it. But yeah, I think it's true. I mean, you know, like who knows? There might be archaeologists digging us up in a few hundred years' time, and you know, they find our phone with all these notes on and go, wow this is this is breathtaking you know we didn't put them into action but they you know it's all in there you know in carbonite or whatever you know in reserve forever, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah you've got to kind of do that and it's really interesting especially when you're saying you know you're 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 planning for the days now but also you've got this three-year horizon in terms of kind of want to get to and again we'll discuss that later on as well so you kind of gently mentioned covid you know i don't want to go kind of too heavy into this because i think we all know the world that we're kind of being in passing through hopefully coming out of but you know 
how has COVID, you know, briefly affected your business? Um, and maybe the follow-up question to that is, is like, you know, have there been any opportunities that have come out of COVID for you as well? Yeah, it's been uh, a super interesting for, year for all of us, but especially, um, I think, for businesses in hospitality, we've really been hit yeah. hard. So for me personally, it's meant um, the, the the temporary closure of the Spice yeah. Club. Uh, so since March, um, cookery school and obviously supper club doors completely closed. Um, and initially for me, um, that was really difficult. Yeah. Uh, obviously from an income standpoint, uh, it's given, but secondly, just what do I do now? <laughs> um, and um, where one door closes, uh, another one opened. Uh, and in my case, um, that led to Shikshuk. So for me, when I look at it now, Shikshuk was born out yeah. of COVID. And had that not happened, I wouldn't have been able to start my own business, yeah. uh, this new business. Um, so for me, um, I just started initially wanting to share uh, recipes with people because we're all at yeah. home. And um, we all kind of are having to cook. And I think a lot of us were cooking more than ever during lockdown. Um, and um, I think initially I just needed to to be able to to connect with yeah. people and say, hey, I've got recipes. You might want recipes, and so let's put those things yeah. together. Um, and uh, started doing the live cookery classes. Um, and I, on Facebook, uh, it was amazing to see the sort of community of people come together. Yeah. And I started doing them weekly, and the same people would come back and invite other people and. That was when I thought that actually this is something really interesting and I shouldn't just ignore no, this. No, it's um, true. I mean, I think, you know, like people talk, you know, and I hate to use the word opportunity uh, when it comes to this. Obviously, it's been a pandemic, you know, obviously lots of people have lost their lives, unfortunately. But I think this kind of once in a generation or more uh, disruption has been definitely interesting to you, you know, because, you know, it's made everybody almost come out of that comfort of just the known knowns every single day, you know, like being able to live barely, yeah. you know, statically, if you will do, you know, we all knew the, the, the rules of the game, you know, and, and now they've all been ripped up, you know, there actually is no game. We're having to reinvent a new game, which is kind of crazy. So I think it's been really interesting seeing how people have had to just go, they've gone from like a, holy shit, like, you know, things are like what's happening now to maybe having that kind of going through all the emotions and going, right, how do I dig myself back out of this? and build something and how is it going to be relevant for a new audience and how is it going to be you know what's life going to be like post covid what's going to change so you know okay massive disruptions happening across all industries right now but it's it's going to be people like yourself who've kind of got off your own ass really and said right how am i gonna you know what am i going to do now what am i going to do next and uh it sounds like you know you've already been putting a lot of work into that and um and obviously ready for post covid do, do you think like things will ever go back to back to normal. I mean, do you, do you or do you think we are kind of seeing a fundamental shift online as well? Yeah, I think um, you know, I think I think things have definitely changed. Yeah. Um, I think, and I think it is a fundamental change. I mean, I see. Yes, of course. And even for my business, if we go post COVID land, I will be able to at some point open up the doors to my kitchen again and have face to face cookery yeah. classes, but. I don't think that that stops um, the the need for people to still want to connect online. Yeah. I think a huge new opportunity. And I say new. I mean, we've been connecting online for so long now, but um, I think this there's this real opportunity that I think is here to stay of being able to have these really meaningful experiences yeah. online um, and uh, learn online yeah. and form communities online and the world has become so much closer yeah. now um, it's incredible um i mean i was just looking last week about uh, doing a cooking class with uh, a japanese chef in japan and wow. you know it's like how has that ever been possible i hope, I hope i've got a uh, you know preview tickets for that one i heard that sounds like my dream combination here like you know i need to make sure you're sending me a private link to this yeah, yeah, I'll give you the hookup, don't worry. But it's true, you know, that, that would have been impossible for, but now it's almost like those boundaries, I guess, have been erased because it's just like, look, how are we both going to help each other? Let's talk, let's discuss, let's see where we go from here. Absolutely, and I think those doors opening are, are hugely attractive and they will, they're here to stay. And I think, um, 
yes, things will go back to normal to an extent. Yeah. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to doing face-to-face <laughs> cooking classes. Yeah, I miss that. And that's a huge part of my yeah. business. But um, I'm also really excited about what we can do online. And, um, you know, people also just reconnecting with themselves now they're at home for the first time. Yeah. I think it's it, it. You're right. I think what's happened actually probably over the last say twenty years, say if you think about the net being in like kind of popular, you know, everyday use really, it kind of has been like the wild west. You know, people expecting everything for free. People expect you know like you're almost like being a um, what would the word be? You know, just just like part. They always say this saying part of the product. Really, you know, we're used to getting it for free, but we're obviously giving up our time or commitment or uh, analytics or whatever. You know, our behaviour to the big companies. But I think, yeah, maybe people have realised they actually want quality. You know, a lot more and those kind of positive things because we have, probably have so many interaction opportunities every day online. But where are the genuine ones? You know, where are the ones we're actually yeah. learning, where are the ones that actually give us happiness. You know, are we just doing everything surface level or are we going a bit deeper and actually having a curated experience? And maybe this, again, is this kind of part of this next generational thing of the likes of yourself who's putting the effort into producing value in the marketplace. You know, great videos, great content, whatever. And hopefully, again, building a building a community around that as well that, that's global as well. Yeah, that that's what's the most amazing thing is the capability of it being global. So where I was limited in my classes for just Manchester and Birmingham, yep. shit has now opened the doors to the world. I feel like I'm being really corny here <laughs> saying these, like, <laughs> we're getting closer, we're opening the doors. But it's really true. Yep. Um, I, I can't imagine that I've got, uh, I mean, I have um, a couple that join me for live classes from North Carolina every t- every class without yep. fail. I've got, you know, students um in iceland and it i mean i couldn't have dreamt of that i mean now it's a real possibility there's like i said initially you know if you love indian food you can be a potential customer of mine that's what it comes down to yeah. and that's not limited to manchester yeah, exactly and that, <laughs> so it's, the, it's the exciting thing i mean you know like um you know and, and then you've got i guess the online offering down the line as well you know you never know where these guys might go sorry i've got to get the entire monica badge collection and go to a live event from iceland in you know manchester or birmingham or wherever you know that's when you know you've got real groupies then you know in terms of people who make the effort as well which is super cool exactly (laughs) now um i've just got one quick question because um you know you've you know, we haven't mentioned it today on the show, but actually, you know, you've had some great opportunities in the past where, you know, you've you've, you've just literally managed to expand your brand massively, you know, and I, I look at that when you're on the BBC Harry Biker show, and, um, you know, that was an amazing thing, you know, for everybody out there. I don't know if you watch it, but place where I remember being in Vietnam and watching the hairy bikers on TV there, which is crazy. So I do know <laughs> that it gets worldwide, uh, the hairy biker show. Uh, and also you had your own Amazon Prime show as well. So, I'm just really interested to know, um, you know, where these opportunities kind of come from and are you being, you know, addressed online, you know, contacted online because you've obviously built a great image around yourself or are you active in going out there and trying to source these partnerships? In those two particular situations, I was very lucky to be contacted by initially uh, the Harry Bikers, I was contacted by the BBC um, and I think they had just um, stumbled across um, my uh, website yeah. presence and uh, were seeing what, what I was doing and um, they were just really interested to find out more. Yeah. Um, and so I was contacted by the producers of that show. Um, and secondly, um, with Amazon Prime, um, I was contacted by... Um, a company called Taste Made, okay. uh, who actually create the show, created the show yeah. for Amazon. Um, and they were running audition, a casting yeah. call for uh, presenters, food presenters to potentially uh, do a new food show for them. I actually had no idea uh, about Amazon at the time. They hadn't mentioned that it would eventually go on to Amazon right. Prime. Uh, I just thought it would be a really interesting thing yeah, to yeah. do. So they called said they invited me to their Shoreditch um, recording yeah. studio um, and asked me to make an onlet right. and record. <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah, I had to go and do like my version of an omelette. Um, and yeah, I, I, the audition went really well and, th- and then they called me back to, to record with them. And so, yeah, I think um, uh, I was really lucky in both situations. I think having 
um, some sort of web presence, even though I was running, you know, brick and mortar, yeah. you know, businesses, uh, was has always been a huge part of, of getting the word out for initially the Spice yeah. Club and what will obviously now be Shook Shook. Um, so, yeah, I think from the get go, I was always on Twitter uh, and always on Facebook. Uh, Instagram's in more of a newer thing for my business. And then just obviously having a good website, you know, that base landing yeah. page has been really good. Uh, being in e-commerce from back in the day um, taught me about SEO, search engine optimization and, and how important that was. And I think, again, like carrying that forward into the food business it helped me maybe when they were searching online to, to find me. I, I don't know. But um, yeah, I, they just got in contact. So I felt very lucky in both yeah, situations. Yeah, amazing. Actually. And I think, you know, like I think those things that like you said about putting yourself out there is so important, really. You know, like if you don't, you know, even if you just have some kind of presence which is updated regularly, people know that you're live and vibrant. It's kind of when, you know, I used to do this when I was booking events for Yelp or looking for people to potentially, you know, be doing great events for us. If that social was dead for a month, two months, three months, you might not think there was anything there. You know, like you might think, oh, have they shut down now? It's the same with venues and websites. If, if, you know, if their details are out of date, you don't actually kind of bother, um, you know, following through with them. You, you probably think it's dead. So I guess putting a, a steady stream of quality stuff out there as well, you know, brings you the opportunities, that kind of attraction really as well. You know, people know that you're in the game. Yeah. And I think also just to add to that, I think something that I found a little bit difficult initially was, you know, when you put things out there, I think now, especially in this society, we expect some sort of immediate yeah. return. And I think, I think I learned the hard way that, you know, actually, even if you put something out there and it's not going to get a million likes, but, you know, people do scroll and it goes into their memory yeah. bank somewhere. It's going somewhere in here. And when, you know, it might not be immediately, but maybe in six months time, uh, they're thinking of a Christmas present or an experience they want to have. And the number of times they've had people come and say, oh, yeah, I've been following you for ages. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, I'm like you've been following me I've never heard from you and I think so many times I used to get so just disheartened by putting so much out there and not getting anything back but then eventually now I have a lot more patience I'm like I think it's important to just be sharing uh regular content so even if I'm not getting an immediate you know oh we'll book with you immediately yeah. um it will happen at some yeah, point you I know agree. it's important to get the feed yeah uh, it's... people's heart. It's kind of like top of mind awareness, isn't it? It's kind of, you know, um, you know, it, it's if you're not doing that, like you said, who knows where these people are finding out about you or eventually making the decision. I think that kind of transient nature of social media means somebody could be following you for 12 to 18 months and then finally goes, do you know what? I see they're releasing Spice Club tickets. I wanted to go and do something new now that COVID's over. Yeah. Um, let's yeah. book a ticket, you know, and, and then you have two customers, yeah. the lot, you know, the long term value of them, lifetime value could be that they book 10 tickets with you in the future. But, you know, if you'd have just stopped and said, oh, do you know what? I can't really be bothered this month or whatever. Who knows where that would have come? Yeah. So I guess you've got to keep that hustle strong as well and, and make sure, obviously, that you're, you're operating there. So we're, we're kind of like moving through a little bit now. You've mentioned some of the stuff, you know, some of your top tips, you know, like, you know, on the Go Solo show here, you know, we're all about empowering entrepreneurs to create their own businesses. So I'm really interested to dig a little bit deeper in some of your top tips. You don't have to kind of give us a full business plan here for every single kind of like thing which I'm going to ask you, but you know, you've mentioned some content, which is great. You know, I'm interested in terms of the audience that you have built. You know, you mentioned some tips there about, you know, about how you built your audience. What what probably would be your top tips if somebody had to go out there now and build an audience from scratch? Um, first of all, I, I know it's really overwhelming yeah. um, to kind of put yourself out there. I think that's, I think, you know, there's some personalities that naturally feel like that's, they're quite comfortable with that. Yeah. But um, a lot of people find it a little bit uncomfortable. I certainly did. I would say um, first, when you're first starting out, you know, just put stuff out there that you feel comfortable with. You know, you want to do this in a really gradual way. Um, for me, um, when I look at my following now, it's a, it's been a slow burn, yeah. but I know that I've grown organically and I've done it with posts that I've been feel, feel really comfortable sharing. And I've only shared when I have really wanted to. I've never shared a post that for the sake yeah. of it. 
Um, I think that's really important. You know, I think people are really clever now and they know when you've scheduled posts. <laughs> yeah. And I'm all for marketing strategies and social media strategies, but, um, you know, there's so much software out there now and it's, you know, we see yeah. through it and our followers do too. So I'm uh, a big tip for me would say, if you're starting from scratch, share stuff that you really care mm. about because people will see through it. If you don't care about it, I think people will go, okay, yeah. what are you trying to so sell? So keep it very genuine um, then and actually, you know, more spontaneous as opposed to actually just, you know, instant scheduling, loads of rubbish basically. Yeah, and don't get me wrong, I think there's definitely um, a place for scheduling, especially when you get to a certain point in yeah. business. I think, you know, you have to have time to do so many different things. So, you know, social media, if you if it feels right in your business to schedule it, then absolutely fair play. But for me, I have always felt, you know, organic yeah. and you win sharing when you feel excited about something and you're sharing it because you're excited. Yeah you can feel that in the post. Yeah, I guess as well, you know, yeah, you put something out there to market, if you will do. And like you said, if you care about it more, you, you're probably more engaged about what the feedback coming back is and how much, how many likes it's had and the like. Whereas if you're just scheduling something that's just a picture of a curry or something, you're like, who cares? There's no commitment on your level. So why should there be commitment on your audience? Absolutely. Yeah. And I think I had to transition a little bit when I went from fashion to food because in fashion it is it's very much about like you know um being the most current and you know what's the new trend and it was constantly changing yeah. and I I used to use Hootsuite a lot yeah, back yeah. then and it was just like and we had a, a, ta a, a little team and I, we hired someone for marketing and we would just be constantly like telling her to you know four four feet four posts a day and schedule them out every two yeah. hours and it didn't amount to anything and 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 now it's it's so obvious and i learned mistakes then and i don't do that now and i think now i have may it be fewer likes or fewer engagements that at least they're at least they're genuine and the more genuine engagements you get online um, the more likely you are for those people to be actual customers of, of yours. Uh, so uh, that's just my experience. Yeah, anyway. no, I mean, look, we want your experience and we want your opinion. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, because, you know, the worst thing that could happen, you know, when we're interviewed entrepreneurs like yourself is that, you know, you just give us some theory that you've read in a book and go, well, I believe that Hootsuite tells us to post four times a day in 2011. So, you know, this is the way, you know, this this is why, you know, we want to be in the trenches with you about what's genuinely working for you. Uh, and obviously, you know, you've got such a dynamic social presence, which is great. I think, you know, Instagram is something you found has been really helpful because, you know, it's amazing for food photography, you know, like, you know, everything is just so vibrant. Is there any kind of other content strategies you use? I mean, I know obviously you do video a lot, you do Facebook Live and stuff like that, but do you ever bother with anything like SEO or any kind of like the long form stuff? Or is it literally more, you know, small pieces, if you will do, it's gonna get instant attention? So um, initially when I first started the Spice Club website, I did a huge amount of uh, yeah. SEO um, and uh, alongside social media. Um, and uh, Shik Shik, now I've started that. Um, I haven't done any SEO to date, but I am planning to do on the new yeah. website. Um, but there's going to the, the huge part of the social media strategy for that is, or the marketing strategy, I should say, will be based on social media. Yeah. And I think one thing that I've um, done slightly different in the launch period and the marketing up to Shik Shik has been trying to involve my customer with me as I build yep. a business. Um, so, uh, which I didn't do with Spice Club. The Spice Club was like, this is what I'm doing. I'm advertising it to you guys. So come if you want yeah. to, where this has been, um, a case of really inviting potential customers or, you know, my following in as I'm growing the business, which is something that I felt a little bit strange about at first because I didn't have anything at that yeah, point. Yeah. I was just had, and I, and, um, I used to use a lot of the, um, Instagram polls yeah. um, on the stories. And I would ask people, you know, I'm thinking about doing this, mm. like, do you prefer A or B? Or what's your style of preference of learning, A or B? Or simple little things, actually. Um, uh, when I was recording some recipe videos, I'd ask really just some from the most simple mundane things, like I've recorded this recipe, I'm about to dish yeah. it up. 
do you think it looks better in this dish or this dish? And so, and it started off as something mundane, but actually, I look back now and I think it was actually quite a powerful marketing strategy in that it really brought people in yeah. and felt like they were really helping to, you know, create, help me on my journey to create what I'm creating. And um, that was really interesting. And that led me to also um, start an online focus group. Yes. Um, I did through um, uh, MailChimp surveys. Right, okay. uh, and so that was that was really good to, um, I just said, well, you know, who would like to be part of the focus group? I would love to ask you questions yeah. about something that we're working on. And so the combination of those That's two That's amazing. Things, yeah. Um, I mean, I think basically, you know, like what you're saying now is based on the experience you have, you know, like you said, I'm not too sure which business this is, whether it's number four, or number five, or number six or whatever over the years, but, you know, you're kind of building it up really almost like a wall, you know, like a different layer every time. And I think, you know, we all want to get product market fit, you know, like in terms of, you know, because you need customers who are going to pay for whatever you're building and also you want to make it relevant. So I think being able to ask the audience exactly what they want is very smart. Like you said, on a marketing level, it's a great way to keep people engaged. But I think being able to offer that product market fit is really strong. Um, you know, one of the features we've built into Subkit um, is that when somebody signs up to your mailing list, you know, you can ask survey questions as well. So it's kind of very helpful, you know, so if somebody say I'm a surf instructor and somebody signed up because they're interested in surf lessons or surf classes, you now we can ask them questions like, you know, what days are you available? You know, how much would you be willing to pay? And what's your budget each month and what level are you at? You know, what, what kind of point to, you know, why are you doing it overall? You know, are you doing it for, you know, because you're entering championships, you know, are you doing it for fitness? Are you doing whatever? And having that means that we can, you know, or the, or the the person who creates the say surf instructor business could select, you know, the pricing which works because they know the average then of what people are willing to pay. They know that maybe Tuesdays aren't popular, so they'll take Tuesday off. They know kind of like whether to run like a, a fitness and surf camp because there's ninety percent of people want that. So I think it's very very important to poll the audience and get an idea, like you said, about the kind of product you want to put out there. Yeah, and also it's a win-win for both sides. So from a company standpoint, you're not spending thousands of pounds on customer research. Yeah. You know, you're going straight to the customer, a potential customer, and you're asking them questions. And also the customer, A, they they look at you and they think this is a company that actually cares and gives yeah. a shit. And um, uh, they, uh, they kind of feel like they're part of something. And also they're getting a product that, that's tailored to what their answers are, you know? So if, if they've been part of the majority and they say, actually, you know, I'm willing to spend this much yeah. and this is my way that I like to learn online. And you're like, well, great. That's what we're doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Take, take well, it's actually, it's, it's a win-win situation on yeah. both. Of course, I guess you've then got a base where you can ask deeper questions. So, you know, say somebody's engaged because they're a subscriber or maybe they've bought, you know, they've been to three of your classes before. You can say, we're thinking about, doing this or that or would you be interested in you know, knock on benefits or products or whatever that you sell so no I, I think that's great I think it's almost like an evolution of this kind of Eric Rees lean startup which was you know the whole terminology being like let's not just build everything let's just start very very slowly and then we'll see exactly. you know what you know where that can kind of go you know we can make mini pivots we can work out what it is but it's a smart way of doing it and um kind of turn takes me on to the kind of like the next question which i've got really about some of your tips so i guess probably it's about your video and presenting because you know um you know i'm not just trying to butt you up here monica for the next question after this but you know you do come across as like someone who's very very natural in front of the camera um you know i'm just interested to know has it always been that way you know like and, and potentially what tips have you got for people who who want to maybe record their own video series or their own video podcasts or whatever you know like how do you embrace that Thank you. That's really nice. Oh, it's true. I've watched a lot of the, uh, like, you know, Facebook or even some of the Instagram kind of mini clips. And, you know, like, you want an engaging person. You know, one of my things, I love watching Saturday Kitchen every week. It's like, I only get to watch about 20 minutes a week because the kids, but, you know, I'm kind of yeah. like, you know, for that bit, you know, you it comes across as that style, if you will do. Like, it's highly produced or whatever, even if it's something that's quite off the cuff. Um, so, you know, tell me, what, what do you think is kind of like, uh, you know, your top tips? I would say that if you looked at some of my early videos from back in the day, you would not feel the same way. Right, that's what I'm doing after <laughs> I, this I think... uh, interview. I'm going to go look at some of these from the archives. 
there's that yeah there's actually um i don't know if, i think it's still on there there's a terrible terrible uh youtube video of me presenting whilst i was at uni i made a onion barbies right. and i'm teaching them. i think i'm like 19 and it's, it's still on there somewhere it's horrendous <laughs> you know no, i've not always been good at presenting um it's definitely something that i've uh had to practice and um I don't do this as often now, but certainly when I was um, presenting uh, and practicing for the uh, Amazon Prime yeah. recordings, um, I practiced in front of the camera over and over and over again. I just don't see. Pe I don't think people see this ever. I think they just just think it's like yeah, so like, oh, you're, you're yeah, natural, yeah. and I'm like, no, I'm not natural. <laughs> I have put hours and hours and hours of me actually getting a camera, putting it on a tripod, putting it in front of me in the yeah. kitchen and and cooking to the camera. Um, I'm, I'm not blessed with those natural skills. Um, and I've just done the same thing over and over again. And I would mess up and do it again and write things down and go, actually, that sounds quite nice. Um, because in food, I think it's really, I find it difficult to find different descriptive words. I keep going back to the same words over yeah. and over again and just simple things. Oh, that's a really good descriptive word to describe something that looks, I don't know, tender or moist or yeah. whatever, you know, and it's simple things like that, that I'd write it's notes down and go, right, okay, now I've got a bank, I've got a food bank, a word yeah. bank. And um, so I did that. Um, and I think um, having to do that over and over again, just really helped me feel really comfortable. And then having to go in front of a studio where there's, seven people there producing yeah. the show and they're just looking at you and they go right action and they're like just be yourself <laughs> well, um, how can i be it's like there's seven of you around here right now that's the opposite of what i'm yeah. going to do and i think i think they told me ahead of time you know this is what the setup is and we're going to tell you to come and just be yourself and i thought there's no chance i'm going to be able to be myself so i'm going to have to practice the hell yeah. out of this and i did i practiced i had i used to shoot five recipes um with them in one day um and i used to practice 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 and i think it just got to a point where it just started to feel more comfortable and if a camera went on yeah. I'd, every time i'd feel less nervous yeah. uh, I'm, I'm at this point now where i've done it for a number of years where now i feel comfortable and now i can't just put a camera in front of me and go i'm going to present a piece of content or whatever right, it is that. and i feel i'm gonna do some gorilla filming of you though monica i'm gonna let you ring you up and just go right oh, there's a camera crew coming around like you know we're, we're doing this you know that'll put you up Actually, but I, I agree you know i think practice is very very important for yourself and i guess when you're doing like a you know quick off the cuff kind of moment on instagram or whatever are you you know how many takes are you doing or are you literally just going do you know what the first or second should be the one probably because it's more you know, you don't want to make it overproduced. I'm just wondering how that kind of works for you. Yeah. So now for, for things like Instagram and um, and things like that, I, I, I generally just, you know, I try and make it. I think the more organic you are, the more natural you are on Instagram, the more connectable yeah. you are. So I feel it's not particularly overproduced. It's just me, selfie mode. And, you know, I'm not particularly, you know, yeah. dressed to the nines or anything like that. It's, it's fairly organic. And I think... Um, like I said, initially, I wasn't very comfortable with sharing much of myself initially. I think I used to feel a little bit conscious and I used to maybe take two or three goes and yeah. be like, no, I'm not happy yet. I think it's taken me a while to, it's taken me a, a, a little bit of time to let go yeah. and just say, hey, actually, I think it's probably better if you are, you know, just slightly off the cuff and it's just more organic and you're real. Yeah. Um, and I even people that I follow on Instagram and I connect with people that I'm, that, it, that I feel like are relatable. Well, I think, you know, we used to say, you know, obviously this is always going to happen because whatever's happened in life, we've been served adverts, you know, like, you know, I'm, I was a big fan of watching Mad Men, like when that came out, I probably watched it about five times over all the series. But, you know, obviously that was the, 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 the dawn of advertising, really, of mass advertising. And, you, you know, it's true that you go on Instagram yeah. now and, it's almost like every other post or every three posts is an advert for something and stuff. And we're being served brands constantly and these professional looking stuff. So 
yeah, being natural kind of makes a lot of sense, really, because, you know, you want to get to a point where people do want to book on with you or, or, or buy some product or service from you because they feel they're going to get something that isn't just some kind of uh, generic kind of homogenous kind of product or something that they might get other places. Yeah, absolutely. And we talk about USP, yeah. don't we, in marketing all the time. And it's really difficult to come out with a, a product that's not been done before and it's revolutionary yeah. and, you know, I mean, there are lots of Indian cookery schools and I'm sure there'll be lots of people teaching online in some form, you know, cookery. I mean, and what I'm doing is not stupidly revolutionary, but my USP is it's me. Yeah. It's the way that I'm delivering my product and that's all we can do. That's going to be, you know, to quote Seth Godin, our purple cow, yeah. you know, that's what we have to bring to the table. That's what we have that's remarkable. Yeah, um, know, know your so, strengths really and know actually what that is that's going to separate yeah. you from anybody else who can't do what you're doing exactly exactly so um i think if you can get that across and we talk about personal brands yeah. and you know i think i think it's really easy to say oh you know your brand needs to be personal but i think it's really difficult to implement that sometimes and not all businesses lend themselves to being naturally personal yeah. Uh, you know, especially if you've got an actual product. Um, uh, and, and I think, you know, not all teachers love to be in front of cameras. They might be great teachers face to face, but it's difficult to to morph that into an online. Not everyone does that naturally. Yeah, I guess as well, you know, like you've got audiences, you know, we mentioned before who use your target audience, but yours is so broad. So it's a case of like, you know, you don't want to be having five or six different marketing messages where, you know, you you know, you're dealing, you know, when I say the kids are genuinely mean kids, guys, you know, and I'm 38, so I'm not feeling that old, but it's like, you know, like, you know, when you've got your 11 year old who's coming, in, okay, I imagine his parents or whatever bought the ticket, but, you know, like, you know, your millennials, you know, Gen X, Gen Ys, boomers, whatever, you know, you don't want to be doing that. So I guess the only way, if you're going to be fairly broad, is to be natural and be you and, and be who you are. I don't feel like you're having to tailor your message to, to one particular audience, really. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think that's what we have to do going forward. I think that's what's going to set us apart as as new entrepreneurs in the market. Yeah, and um, yeah, just don't shy away from that is what I'm yeah. absolutely saying. And our, our final tip really, which I'm looking for before we enter our rapid fire round, the really exciting rapid fire round, I'm pleased to say there's no points to be earned, I've got to say, but you know, you never know. It's, uh, so, so what kind of stuff do you do for work-life balance or is that literally just like, you know, like holy shit what, what what else do i do outside of this at the moment you know like with two businesses and you know loads of other stuff going on like you know what sort of stuff do you do that helps you relax or take a step out you know are there any fitness regimes or anything like i'm just interested to know like how you keep it all together because running a business is hard work but it's great work you know like so i'm just interested in how you keep it together on a daily basis yeah um so i'd say Apart from this launch week that I've had up to Shikshik, which has been yeah. work and no <laughs> um, Up until that, I, I try uh, and, and keep a, a work-life balance for my mental health more than anything else. But for me, um, morning workouts uh, are huge. So I used to go to the gym, but now I'm just working out from yeah. home. Um, and uh, maybe for me, it's like I need to just get at least 15, 20 minutes yeah. in. Half an hour from feeling particularly energetic. But um, 15, 20 minutes, maybe some hit in the yeah. morning or um, some uh, Pilates or some sort of physical activity. Um, I'd like to go on walks. Yeah. So I find, especially here in the UK now, where we are in the year, it's getting dark at four. Mm. And often, um, I, you know, I, I get into the office and I'll get on the computer and I'll be there, you know, nine o'clock, 10 o'clock. And then I find out it's like three, four o'clock and I've sat here. Mm. And I've maybe gone to the kitchen at some point and the bathroom, obviously. And then I look outside and it's dark. And when I woke up, it was dark. Yeah. I find that really difficult. Um, and so I try and make sure that I go out in the day, maybe even if I just go to the garden. Mm. It doesn't always happen, I'll be honest with you, because, um, you know, it's cold. Yeah. It is, yeah. <laughs> um, the uh, but I always do. Sometimes I, I like to just have a phone call in the middle of the day. I, I talk to my, my mom or my dad yeah. um, today and that's quite nice just to talk to someone and connect to someone else I find it 
it can, can be quite lonely otherwise. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, there was uh, some article in the paper recently about a uh, is it Hugo, the like uh, kind of Scandinavian kind of a, uh, you know, feeling of comfort in life. And they were basically saying like in Denmark or Sweden, I think it was like when there's hardly any light at all. And, you know, they get out for at least half an hour, no matter what the weather is, you know, and it just makes your soul feel so much better. So I think that is so important. But you know, connections with family and friends is, is also so important because like you said, I, I do the same. You know, I, I sometimes get locked in and you go, wow, it's Friday all of a sudden. And, and how did that happen? So it's very, very important to get that kind of routine as well. Right. So ready for a rapid fire round, Monica? <laughs> we'll find out now. here we go yeah <laughs> all right cool so favorite entrepreneurs and why a short why oh. as well <laughs> okay um i'd probably say um my dad um my dad came from india to uh, liverpool in the yeah. 80s with uh, less than 50 quid in his pocket and um he uh did incredibly well. He started off with a job at the job center and then said, this isn't for me and started off doing markets in Liverpool, selling um, menswear, just men's office yeah. shirts and started doing markets. And from those markets, he eventually uh, earned enough to own his own shop. Um, and he had a family business with his brothers. Um, and then when that didn't work out with the brothers, he decided to start up his own thing and he continued to work um, tirelessly to make sure that um, his family were, you know, the generation ahead of him were going to do a lot better. He he grew up, you know, in, in, with five brothers in India with um, his dad was in England for his upbringing. So he didn't really grow up with his dad. Yeah. And um, so his dad was trying to make things better for him. Yeah. And then, you know, my dad talks about how there was one bed with five brothers in it. Yeah. And that for me blows my mind. Um, and eventually, yeah, he, when he came over to England, he worked really hard to make sure that my brother and I would never have to have a life even close yeah. to that. And being able to see him go into work every day and Saturday was off for him because he wanted that to be a family yeah. day. Um, and just seeing his work ethic day in, day out and the sacrifices he made and, um, and, and how he progressed in his life from where he was and then one year he took us back to India where he where he yeah. lived and it was incredible to see that and so that's always been an inspiration for me just I have that in my life every day and so um yeah I'm going to choose oh, my dad I mean okay. look that, that's amazing I mean look this is the almost like the uh, the full circle complete now because we started off this call today like saying you know where uh, you know like how did you get into it and why and is entrepreneurship in the blood so Clearly it is. And when you have that kind of primary source of inspiration, it's great. Plus you actually answered my second question, which was who is your most inspiring person and why? So perfect here, Monica. This is great. You know, you might have gone through all 10 questions here actually once. So so let's uh I'm really really rapid. Oh, what, sorry? <laughs> oh yeah, super rapid. Really? <laughs> yeah, you're right. So um any favorite business books which come to mind or any online business resources that you just can't kind of get enough of, you know, that you would maybe suggest to other people wanting to start their businesses? So a huge fan of Tim Tim Ferriss' yeah. podcast. Huge, huge fan. Just again, looking at how other people have, you know, uh, come along on their journey and what lessons they can give us. I'm a massive fan of Tim Ferriss and who he yeah. interviews. Um Big fan of Seth Godin, Purple Cow. That was a big game changer yeah. for me. Um, and also Seth Godin's podcasts. Are really, I, I, I love listening to them. Really inspirational. And also always feel like recharged when I listen yeah. um, to his podcasts. Um, yeah, those two. No, they're sure. good guys. And I think as well, you know, like the, uh, the Seth Godin daily tips are always worth it. If anybody hasn't signed up to his yeah. mailing list, you know, it's really handy just to have that in your inbox every day. Kind of just makes you look at things with a different perspective as well, which is really handy. Um, no. This might be tied into this, but what's your favorite social media accounts to follow? This could be like local from anybody who maybe inspires you locally in terms of your business or ones that maybe people should follow because they're going to get great business tips. Oh, this is rapid fire <laughs> now. You're making me think. <laughs> 
Um, and I can never think of Instagram handles when I need to. I'm always. I'm the same with Twitter. Of... I find myself having to have a double thing. I would have thought like 15 years on or whatever, Twitter would have sorted it that you could get the full information when you're copying someone in or whatever to make the tagging somebody to get the to get the right handle. But uh, enough about my problems on yeah, social. Account that shows the 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 message boards from the London Underground services. They're really yeah, cool. Yeah. I've seen those. That's that's called Instagram account. Just for inspiration. Okay. Um, what else from a business standpoint? Um, let me think. Let me think. Um, you can draw a blank if you want. That's that's allowed on the rapid fire round. You know, we. Can... Going back to it, if okay. I think I'm going to make a do. circle of that then and do that. Um, if you could do all of this over again, um, what would you probably do more of? Like, you know, to, to grow your business, like, what would you say, you know, what what would what would kind of lead you to either faster results or better results or whatever? Or what, what do you basically think you do the most of, which obviously gives you most value? Um, I would probably um, have more chats with myself. I, I have a lot of self-doubt. I have like a bit of an imposter syndrome. Yeah. And um, I think uh, I, I often hesitated to do things unless... You know, I was really I had to sort of push myself or talk to other people and they would have to convince me to do things. And so um, I was really lucky that I had family that encouraged me to yeah. do that. But I think if I had less self-doubt earlier. I probably would have done a lot more mm. quicker and started things quicker. And um, I think that um, it's difficult to take the first step yeah. often. I think when I got married and moved from Manchester to Birmingham and I was on my own for the first time, that first year of being a, a true solo entrepreneur was really scary and I doubted myself a lot. I didn't have my crew to tell me like, no, you're going to be cool, don't worry, it's absolutely <laughs> yeah, fine. Yeah. I didn't have that like actual support network and I think um, the self-doubt massively crept in that year and it, it delayed the start of things. I could have started things a lot earlier and... Um, yeah, I think um, just having a bit of time to, and a bit of space, to just have a chat to yourself, um, write things down and, and reassure yourself that actually, um, just try. And like, do you, is there anything you've maybe done to change your mindset on that? Or is it literally just like, are you one of these confidence people? Like like a lot of us are like that, you know, I, I obviously have been working a lot of entrepreneurs over the last 10 years and helping support some of them, mentor them. but. Imposter syndrome is a big thing, you know. Do you think it's more like the more confidence you have from having success that that's what drives you on, and it's the starting? And you know, they always say momentum is one of the most important things in business. Um, is it that, or have you got anything that's kind of changed your mindset, or is it more just like I wake up every day and think, right, we're gonna have a good day, or or whatever? I try and do that, but that doesn't always yeah. work. <laughs> um, sometimes I don't wake up feeling particularly like woo. Yeah. Um, but um, I think the more success you get as you go on does help. Saying that though, that doesn't stop me from feeling like I've got imposter syndrome even now when I look back and there's been some, it's been an amazing journey and I've been doing this for 10 years now, but I still sometimes wake up feeling like, I don't know why people have bought this. <laughs> it's you know, why they bought into me and what I do. And I still definitely feel that. But I think um, I like to write stuff down mm. a lot. I like to... Um, make notes on how I feel yeah, as, yeah. you know, um, as, you know, uh, funny as that sounds, I do. I, I like to write. I used to keep a lot of diaries when I was younger, especially when I first started the Spice Club. Uh, um, and um, I just used to write down what I was thinking and um, how I was feeling. And I've started to return back to that a lot yeah. more. I think that helps just airing out what's going on in here. Because... Uh, also yeah, busy right. it's I mean that going back to Tim Ferriss before the Hugh Jackman one he did a couple of months ago. I don't know if you listened to that, but he was talking. You know, Hugh Jackman was saying you know, he's started doing a lot more journaling now, based on some of the books he'd read and other people doing it. And it's just a good way of processing that information and having that kind of natural time just to to work out where you are. But you know, there are a lot of people even on the Ferriss show who are like you know high up who get imposter syndrome as well and think, what the hell am I doing here? You know, at the end of the day, we're all the same DNA and whatever. Do you know what I mean? Like, you know, we're all just a human being who's ended up on this planet with no real kind of 
book about why we're here. It's more just like, you know, are we yeah. doing something that fulfills us every day and we're adding value to the world? And, you know, are we happy? That's the most important thing, I think, to, till we get to the end. You know, hopefully people see that as a positive way. It's not too deeply depressing yeah. and philosophical. Yeah. There, but it's kind of true, though, you know, like it, I get what you say. It can be kind of hard just to kind of get up every day and say, right, you know, let's be in my absolute optimum way I'm going to approach life. But, you know, like we all have to realize, hopefully, at some point that, you know, like we're all kicking ass, hopefully, in our own in our own way, really. And, uh, you know, you've got a lot to be proud of in terms of where you've got to now as well. Um, if time was of no significance at all, Monica, what would be the number one thing that you would do just over and over again right now to grow your business? You know, like if literally you were only allowed to have one thing that would help grow your business, what would you do? Continue to own my skill, which is cooking. Yeah. That's what I do. I teach people how to master Indian cookery. And for me, um, it would just be continue continue to own my craft and get better and finesse. Yeah. And that brings me, that's helpful because it brings me joy yeah. anyway, being in the kitchen. Um, but yeah, just, I wish I could do that more. I mean, I absolutely wish I could do yeah. that more. Um, but I have to have a, a specific time for that. And um, yeah, I have to run the business and all of that stuff. But if I could just spend my whole time just doing that, I absolutely Well, wish. maybe that's the leap, you know, we'll do a, a check-in with you in a couple of years and see where things are at. And it's literally just like, yeah, I've got a team of 10 and a full production team. And, you know, now I just, you know, you get to travel the world. Cause I know you did a big trip to India last year, I think it was, and learn again a lot more about the local flavors and, and exactly what was out there. Um, this one is a question, only a few more kind of left here, but, you know, I'm interested to know as, uh, you know, a funny anecdote maybe that's happened in your business over the years. Has there been anything where you've just gone, wow, that was completely, totally random or, you know, anything that you'd like to share that was kind of a funny experience that you had? There was a time that, um, so obviously running a business from your home, right. well, running a restaurant from your home, I should say, when the Spice Club first started, um, you know, comes with, all the things that happen when you live in a home. And um, there was one time, so I don't know if you remember, Johnny, I know you've been to one of a few of my events, but we used to send the address out 24 hours before the actual date yeah, of the event. So this particular event was on a Saturday night. And um, on a Friday would be like the big prep mode. I'd be there, you know, gym jams, but like an apron on yeah. and hair back, hair net, and just really getting in the zone <laughs> prep. I know, I think I know where this is going, but please. <laughs> so Friday at 7 p.m. on the dot, the doorbell goes. And I'm like, I'm not expecting anyone. I'm really like, smell of masala. Yeah. Like, I don't want to smell, but it's fine. And I just, you know, it's just a hot mess, basically. Yeah. And then open the door and it's this couple who are dressed to the nine. They've got, you know wine and they're clearly ready for the spice club event yeah. and they're like hi here for the spice club <laughs> and i said oh right uh you've got a long day can you come back tomorrow <laughs> wow so um, they must yeah be, stuff like that they must have been expecting uh, almost to be like an illegal rave like you're actually like messaging them with the, like the, the date or the address right then it's like right you know they're in there like great gear like we've got to get in the car now and get there it's just like uh you know like you said 24 hours uh notice is, is, is you know i can understand that being quite amusing actually at the time did, did and did they come back they weren't too embarrassed to come back the next day absolutely, absolutely. yeah i didn't think they were going to but they because they looked horrified <laughs> Um, and I wasn't sure if they looked horrified because of how I looked, because I was just like... Yeah. You're not like, you're not who's yeah. on the photos of the website or whatever. <laughs> so who are you? It's like, yeah. What, what? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But um, no, they, they came back. We've also had a couple of times where, because it was always bring your own yeah. beer, your own alcohol rather, um, that people just brought way too much. And they forget that they're in someone's front yeah. room. And you know, I'm like... My mum and dad are here, guys. <laughs> yeah. Chill like, it out, chill it out. But um, yeah, we've had a few people that have maybe had a bit too much to drink, which is always entertaining. Yeah. But it's fun. I mean, it's in your home. It was. It's just funny that you that I would finish prep and then I'd go upstairs to have a shower and then come back down and then clock in. It's yeah. just it's the whole thing. It's crazy, but I guess it's kind of of the time and also that kind of Airbnb world we were entering in when it started, you know, that it, those kind of boundaries and barriers broken down between, you know, like, yeah, 
your home and and everything else you know and i think that's what was always so pleasant was that it was like very natural and you know that's the, kind of how it felt okay you wouldn't want to do it every day but it kind of you know yeah. yeah but you know every two or three weeks really cool um as an entrepreneur and this can be you know even if you just want to use a few words like to describe this you know what does ultimately success mean to you as an entrepreneur I think success for me um, is where in my own business, you know, the fact that I'm delivering a product that brings uh, happiness and satisfaction to the end user. Um, and that's, that's a huge part for me. It's an added bonus if I get customer retention and they come back to yeah. me. Uh, that's why I see like the double tick of success um, when I have a group of regulars yeah, yeah. and they that for more um i think i think there's something really special as an entrepreneur to create a product and put your everything into yeah. it and then for that to be passed to the end user and for them to get that joy and they see what you put in i think that's a really beautiful process yeah. that for me is a huge mark of success when that end user gets the joy that you wanted them to get out of that product yeah. and to see that and and um for them to then maybe pass it on to someone else that for me is a huge mark of success it's truly personal mm. to me um and that brings me joy like i still get really really excited when someone you know sends a picture of a recipe that they've created it's my recipe that i've taught them and they've sent the picture of the, the samosas or the yeah. chicken curry <laughs> or or the chapatis and they and they'd send a picture and they say, look, I made it and it tasted really good. And that for me is success. Every time I, I get those moments, I'm just, I always feel overwhelmed that, oh, it worked <laughs> yeah, again. Yeah. <laughs> but I guess you kind of need that. I mean, you know, in a business, okay, you know, we all want to make a load of money. That's clearly something which is successful for a business. Again, it's different levels of how, where that success is, whether it's 10 billion or 10,000 a year or whatever, but actually, there isn't going to, unless you're passionate about it, really, it's very rare that actually you will have the motivation to drive you on each day. Like you said, you see tangible results and you get obviously a massive kick from it. And I think that's probably why people are buying into it. I mean, we discussed it early why people are buying into you as a person, what makes you different and what separates. And I think, I guess, the moment you fall out of it, you know, out of love with it, I don't think you will do, but I guess if you did it every single day, like an event or whatever, yeah. you'd be like, I need some time out. So it is one of those things, I guess, in terms of, uh, you know, you can feel the love coming through in, in everything you do. And like you said, it's it's almost like uh, instant feedback. If someone's, you know, you've made an impact on someone's life. If they've gone and made the samosas, they wouldn't have done that without you there. Yeah. They say it's amazing. Right, yeah. then they might do it five, six more times that year. So a um, couple yeah. more quick questions. So if somebody out there was thinking about taking the plunge and creating their own business, you know, say going solo, uh, what advice would you give to them? I would say, A, go for it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> secondly, I would say, um, don't um, be put off by the slow burn um, and don't expect instant results. I think we live in this time where we need this instant gratification and we need the instant results that we've put the money in and when, when are we going to expect it back? Yeah. Plus, plus return. Um, it's often not like that. It, it is a slow burn. It's like what you said, like you look really natural in front of the camera, Monica. And I'm like, let's just rewind that by about 10 years and let's look at where I yeah, started. Yeah. And now, I'm and I think be prepared for the slow burn and don't see that as a negative yeah. because those are the formative years, if I wouldn't have had those years of just doing the same thing over and over again, I wouldn't have picked up what I, what I now know. And yeah. I think look forward to that, embrace the slow burn, embrace the growth. Cause once you're here, you know, yeah. it's, 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 it's not the same anymore. You're not that, you're a different person up yeah. here compared to where you started. And I think you should just uh, look forward to that. Um, and um yeah, that's what oh, no, I'm very, very cool. And, um, you know, we talked at the start of this, you know, you said you plan three years ahead. Um, you know, what, what is that kind of vision like? Where do you think this can go in terms of the business? You know, have you got any, you know, don't worry, you don't need to give me details now so all of your ideas get stolen. But, you know, like, <laughs> what, what's the, you know, like, do you see other ideas in your head that you want to play around with, like whether that's a different business or different features or whatever? Or is it literally a case now that you've got the online version of Shack? Like, 
you know, like that you can just scale that to a massive height? Like what's that kind of vision in terms of where you see it in a few years time? Um, I, I, yeah, I mean, I'd love to uh, scale Shikshuk and I think it's, it's, it's very young where it is right now. I mean, I've been able to somewhat digitalize what I do face to face. Nothing replaces that. This is Shikshuk has never meant to replace the Spice Club. It's just an extension of the business. Yeah. But if I can um, build that to be something just as special in terms of the engagements that I have with my online uh, customers and my online following with Shikshuk, um, that will be a huge mark of success. I think one thing that I found really difficult when I was creating the videos is how do I emulate what I do face to face in a video? Cause it's still, there's still a barrier in between, yeah. right? It's not, they can't see me and not there in physical presence. So being able to make the online experience even more immersive um, is a goal of mine in the next three years. How can we really, you know, um, get that, that, that connection even stronger. Yeah. Um, how can we make the online experience more enjoyable, more immersive, um, and tra- how how I can better translate my recipes yeah. and what I teach to my uh, online customers? Um, I really want to make Shiksha uh, a really a, a, a community of you know Indian food lovers and where we can share yeah. and almost a little world of you know um, uh, people that just love Indian food and they know that that's going to be. The place to go yeah, to, yeah. you know, when it's hey, you know, I've got this question. Well, I'm I'm all for uh, yeah. immersive experiences there, Monica, and you know, like I'm envisioning myself sat there with like a VR headset, like Oculus Rift, to say a couple of years, like smell a vision or something. And it, no, that's, that's what, what we, we need. need. You know, I hope I haven't just ruined your plans. You know, AJ or whatever is in a lab right now trying to work on that or something, but. Of human essence. Yeah, who knows actually where that's going to be? I mean, you know, it sounds good, but uh, no, that's really exciting, and I think it is worth planning. Um, what's your favorite recipe to cook? Like, I'm just interested to know, like, what what would that be? You know, and you know, what what kind of uh, what what sort of thing do you get? Um, you know, enjoy cooking the most. So, um, I love more than anything street food. Yeah. Absolutely love street food, specifically Indian street food, but. One of my recipes that I like to make that I've probably never taught, yeah. I don't think I've ever taught this recipe, but um, it's something that you do with leftover dal. Okay. So if you've got, this is, a, this is something that I learned from my mother-in-law and my husband's yeah. family, and they're all from Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so what they do is they have this thing called dal muri. Muri is toasted puffed rice. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's almost like, you know, rice krispies. Yeah. Like you have in Belpuri, like the kind of thing. So, yeah. Yeah. Moody's in Belpuri, exactly. So, you know your stuff, Johnny. I didn't have to explain <laughs> that. Well, do you know what I mean? I am slightly addicted to Indian food, but, you know, what can I do about that? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so um, we get the, the toasted puffed rice and then we have anything. So, usually in Kolkata, it's, it's, they make um, like a dried fried potato, yeah. but they often will use like a leftover potato curry dry. Yeah or left with the dal. And so I do it with dal a lot because I make dal all yeah. the time. So um, I don't always have um, puffed rice in, so I just use Rice Krispies. Wow. So Rice Krispies at the bottom, leftover dal on top, um, finely chopped chilies, yeah. coriander, lime juice, um, and then uh, a little bit of mango pickle or if you've got any type of Indian yeah. pickle. And then the biggest thing that you need to do is add something called mustard okay. oil and um, it's like a teaspoon of mustard oil it's really aromatic it's very warming it smells of mustard it's delicious you mix everything together so you've got this element of crunch but then you've got the creaminess from the dal or the potato and then you've got the fresh chili and heat and the coriander and the lime and tartness and sweetness all at the same yeah. time and then there's warmth from the mustard oil and it it's amazing it takes five minutes to make I make it about four times a week. (laughs) (laughs) It's like giant pots of it, I imagine, like kind of on the side. Yeah. I call it, I call it nice crispies. Oh, right. Well, do you know what? This is an idea I'm going to rip off here. Do you mean there'll be like a nice crispies van or a nice crispies shack or whatever like happening soon? (laughs) Yeah. So that's one of my favorite things. I guess you could say to make. It's more to assemble. Yeah, but I mean. But it's 
but I, I guess you know as a savory snack as well you know like that but i guess the rice krispies had a bit of sugar in it in terms of is it more like sweet savory or can you not is it minimal the taste yeah it's more for for crunch and texture more than anything it's not rice krispies if you eat them they've got a bit of sweetness but it's not you know overpowering yeah, yes. um and yeah ideally you'd have the toasted puffed rice but um if not Rice Krispies will do, and it works a treat. It's delicious. It's crunchy and spicy and sweet and all the Well, time. one of my goals when I got back from India was, and obviously it didn't work out, but I, for years I thought I would really love to set up like a catty roll kind of cafe or whatever because, you know, again, spent a lot of time in Calcutta, so again, eating Belpuri and catty rolls and stuff. And uh, for anybody out there who doesn't know what catty roll is, it's basically like an Indian burrito. I mean, that's really giving it a disservice, but... The best way yeah. to describe it in terms of it's a wrap with some really amazing Indian food in. Um, you know, there's a couple of places I remember going to place in London and stuff like that as well, like Catty Roll Co. But I think having something like that would be amazing, you know, on a on a daily basis. So that never happened. But, you know, never say never in a few years' time if it still hasn't never, been done. Never. Please open that, Johnny. <laughs> I, Catty Roll is my, oh, my, my, my favourite Indian street food snack out of all of them. Yeah. So Here yeah, you go. absolutely, I, I executive producer. I would hope that you'd be our our executive chef, Monica. Do you mean like you know uh, you, you don't want to leave me with uh, in the kitchen? I'm not too bad, but uh, you know I don't know if I could be tuning out hopefully hundreds of catty rolls an hour. So uh, cool. Well, I, I've really enjoyed today's chat, Monica. I really appreciate you coming on the Go Solo Show. Um, you know, remind everybody where they can get in touch with you. So obviously you're on social. Uh, what's your Instagram and what, what's your kind of a, um, you know, website addresses as well? Yeah, yeah, sure. So I'm at The Spice Club on Instagram um, and also on Twitter. Yeah. Um, I'm at uh, forward slash The Spice Club UK on Facebook. And then the website is uh, for Shikshik. It's www.shikshik.co.uk. And if you ever want to come to an in-person cookery class, whenever we open again, it's... Um, www.spiceclubuk.com. Very cool. Well, uh, yeah, thanks very much for taking the time to meet us today and uh, we'll catch up with you soon. Take care. Cheers. Thanks, Bye. Johnny. Take care. Bye.